You're finally at that hot new spot. The one your friends keep raving about. Sitting across from your date. It's going... Another round? Really well. And that dish you've been dying to try? Oh, it's headed your way. You can smell it. Hear it sizzling fresh off that skillet as it comes closer, closer, and served. Go ahead. Enjoy. After your phone sneaks a bite first. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, actor Mike McShane shares a story about working in restaurants and trying to get ahead. And as the hot summer wore on, I was back behind the dishwasher machine again. And the human environment of moisture, grease, and soap for eight hours combined with no ventilation. But there was hope on my horizon. And one day, Mr. Spade called me into his office and pointed to the file cabinet. Hanging on the top cabinet handle was a short-sleeved white shirt and a pre-tied bow tie. I looked at them and then to Mr. Spade, who was smiling knowingly at me. I was being made a busboy. The shirt was enough, but I had a tie which in the restaurant business was a badge of trust and access to the front, where the people were. Today on Story Worthy, actor Mike McShane talks about his days working in restaurants as a dishwasher and finally being promoted to busboy. Stay close. Hi, this is Mike McShane, and you're listening to Story Worthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Now, I'm so glad you guys tuned in today. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the story last week from comedian actor John O. Wilson and his story about his near-death experience. I mean, I got to tell you, it is it is really a great story. He basically got caught up in a riptide that, like, carried him out to sea. And it is, it's scary, man. But it's also very funny because John O is just a funny guy. So go back and listen to that. But not today. Not today, you guys. Because today I'm here with actor Mike McShane. And he, he's actually another improv actor like John O. And he brings forth the topic, Bus Boy to the Stars. And you don't hear that every day, do you? Now, I don't know about you guys out there, but if you haven't worked in a restaurant, like, you should have, or you should, because it's a specific, it's a specific skill. You know, it's a specific level of customer service and it gets you to appreciate your whole life, what people are doing in restaurants (laughs) and, and the immediacy and how fast things happen and being in the weeds. So I've, I've worked as a waitress in like 18 restaurants, all different restaurants, German, um, French, Italian, Mexican, all sorts of restaurants. Uh, but I was a busboy in one, and that was that was when I was 19, and I went to Colorado to spend the summer at like this lodge in Rocky Mountain National Park. I did that for three years, and at this lodge, I wanted to be, of course, a waitress. You know, it was an expensive restaurant, so of course you make more money, and I had the experience. But at this restaurant, they were singing waiters and waitresses, and I don't sing, so they made me a busboy, which you're called even if you're a girl. You're a bus. You're a bus boy. By the way, the whole singing waiter thing, like that, doesn't fly to me because it's like, I'm sorry, sir, your order is up, but I can't get your steak a poil right now because I have to go sing "Climb Every Mountain." You know what I mean? And you can see like people's orders up because the kitchen was like in this big lodge, so like the whole the chefs were you know v- visible. You could see them. You could see your food sitting over there, but you're not getting it because she's over there singing something from Sound of Music. Anyway, so I was a busboy there. You know what we used to do, Mike? We used to steal off of people's plates. The, you know, the food would come mm-hmm. back as you're, mm-hmm. you know, bussing the tables, which I wonder where the term bussing ever even came from. So I'd be bussing the tables, and the food would come back, and we would take food off their plates, specifically the pecan pie. We would never let that go uneaten. And we would take, or if they left, like, <laughs> like a piece of seafood, or like a piece of a certain piece of meat, then we we would eat that. We just eat that right off the right off their plate. We don't care. Yep. Did you do that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because I picked her off the plate. Yeah. Sometimes I would go by people's tables before they were done. I'd just sweep it up. Okay, take that away. 
I'm not done. Yeah, sure, but... t- take the steak back. I will take it right back into my mouth. <laughs> One time at that restaurant, the Grand Lake Lodge, where I was a busboy, one time, it, there was a thunderstorm in the summer, right? It was a big thunderstorm in the mountains, and the electricity went out. And so me and my friend, his name was, his name was Ian. Wait, was it Ian? It doesn't matter. But the point is, me and two of the other busboys, Ian and Cam Fung, I think his name was. No, wait, that was the guy from Hawaii. Hawaii Five-0. Five-0. But it was, an, it was an Asian name. Cam Fung. <laughs> Cam Fung has Chin Ho. <laughs> Why they changed that name, nobody knows. But the point is, so me and the other buzz boys, when the lights went out, of course, we were supposed to be helping the guests, the patrons with candles, etc. But all three of us went into the back of the restaurant and started shoving that pecan pie in our face. We may die. Let's eat to our fill. I mean, it was like, nobody is going to see us now. Right. You know, let's, let's do this thing. And that's what... I'm surprised you didn't lift some wallets. <laughs> anyway, good times. Um, but I do think that everybody at some point should work in the restaurant industry because it is a wild and wacky business that is difficult. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I would leave restaurants, you know, after a waitressing job or, or busing tables, I would feel like I got beat up. And I was like 19, 20, 22. I was a kid. But it was still, <laughs> it's hard work, isn't it? It's a strange it's a strange arrangement and in higher end restaurants it's that traditional agreement if people aren't jerks between the waiter and and the and the customer of it, per, 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 sort of together creating an evening you have your expectations the restaurant is advertised to fulfill them and then you're a representative of the restaurant's ethos so if it's like one of those remote cold things it's that little service if it's warmer and less european it's like hi how you doing i'm michael be your waiter it has these different different codes and you got to plug into the one you're working with well that's interesting you should say that because i always preferred and i worked at so many restaurants that i i did understand that you know the higher end restaurants i worked at sure the 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 amount at the end of the you know the amount on the check would be higher because the entrees are higher but you're spending two and a half hours on one table counting on them right. to give you that tip. And if they don't give you that tip, you're screwed. So I preferred to work in like the middle, the middle ground. I worked at this Mexican restaurant called Tequila Junction in Pittsburgh for three years. But where the entrees were like eight, nine, ten bucks. So the tables were right, turning, turning every hour. Therefore, you had a better chance of maybe at the end of the night getting to that 15 or 18 percent. Right. I want to get to your story, but before we get to your story, I did want to remind you guys out there to head over to my website, storyworthypodcast.com, and just check it out. You know, there's pictures, there's a mailing list, do what you will, and don't forget to subscribe to Storyworthy on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Mike McShane is here right now, you guys. He is an actor and a singer and a comedian and an improviser. He appeared in the original British television show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? And other TV roles include guest appearances on Seinfeld as Kramer's nemesis, Franklin Delano Romanowski, FDR. Mike's also been on Frasier, Malcolm in the Middle, King of the Hill. And on the big screen, you may have seen him in Robin Hood, like you mentioned, Drop Dead Gorgeous, A Bug's Life, which I don't. Which voice did you do? In a- I was tuck and roll the two Hungarian roly poly bugs <laughs> who basically <laughs> speak in gibberish, spoken well, gibberish. Mike, you've done so many great things, and like you've talked about, you were on Office Space, which is one of my very favorite movies. And you guys can find Mike over on Twitter at this Mike McShane. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the amazing Mike McShane. In 1969, Kansas City was slowly waking up to the 60s and hippies were suddenly sprouting up around the stoic civic fountains, freaking out the white people, finding their way in the ignored and unused corners of the town that were ripe for head shops and waterbeds. But not in North Kansas City, by God. Developers had gone out of their way to give the people a new, clean, modern mall to shop in. It was called The Landing, meaning that you had arrived. And when you arrived, you had rooftop parking, so you could slide out of your Buick and look at the view which in Kansas City, frankly, was long, low, and wide. You could have stood on a stump and gotten as good of a view, but the ability to look around like a prairie dog and then rush down into the relaxed, open central courtyard and shop, shop, shop was welcomed with beefy, open arms. It was colorful and spartan, a contradiction that only the young, sophisticated Midwesterners could appreciate. And it was where I had my first job as a busboy. If for some, being an actor is a calling, not unlike the church for others, then being a busboy 
was truly the right place to apprentice into show business. So after a flurry of rejections, a local restaurant group with a number of fine dining establishments in its roster answered in the affirmative. I don't doubt that the way I looked had something to do with it. I was tall, pear-shaped, a soft-shouldered boy with a massive brown curly afro of hair which seemed to grow up and out simultaneously. That, coupled with my raging angst and waddling gait, made me look like nothing more than an angry mushroom from Sid and Marty Cross' Saturday morning lineup. My perpetual field jacket, the classic shape-softening choice of many obese, petulant white teenage boys, completed the look. The look, like I said, that won me an important position. In the back. Way in the back. Hidden behind a giant industrial dishwashing machine. <laughs> the name of the restaurant was The Leather Bottle. If you travel across the Midwest, even now, you'll see remnants of the great age of surf and sauce restaurants. The Drunken Steer, the Beef and Brew, King Henry's Table. They often promised a slightly exotic British experience, which strangely revolved around something which Kansas had in spades already. Beef and booze. Well, at least beer. But the leather bottle was one of the first, and it had something I had never seen before, which was a wine list. And a computer-controlled bar dispersal system all housed underneath a clever pub-like set, sconces with lantern lights and snug corners, stools and beamed ceilings and plaster walls with portraits of famous sheep. <laughs> I was a science fiction nerd then and still am, so it was pure Bradbury-flavored dystopian candy to me. I chuckled, pleased with myself that I'd gotten the irony of it all, which made it easier to swallow the fact that I wasn't even a busboy. I was a dishwasher. But it was my first job, which meant my first check, and I was away from the house, all their own powerful currency at 14. So I threw myself into it with enthusiasm, knowing that soon enough I would advance until I was at least a knight in this amazing kingdom, if not counselor to the king. <laughs> the king was named Dale Spaeth. He was soft-spoken, tall, and remote, with a dent in the center of his forehead. He had a way of appearing near you suddenly while you were working, which, when you're a dishwasher, is kind of disturbing. He liked how I was getting on, stacking the plates and lining them up for the cooks, and he gave me this warm look, or a look for him that meant warmth and possibly not a stomach condition. But so far at the leather bottle, I was working and sliding my way up the food chain well. I felt satisfied, which I needed because it was 1969, and the year before, for me, was extremely unsatisfying. And I was also unknowingly fitting into an uncomfortable and unsatisfied new America. And I was looking for a way out like the rest of us, a way out of Kansas City, in my case. One day, Mr. Spaeth asked me to stay on the clock and come down to the basement and help him stock the bar. And it struck me as unusual that one of the regular barbacks, Don Mumford, wasn't there. He was the usual guy. I inquired about Don. And Mr. Spaeth turned to me, fixed me with his pike-like gaze, and said in a confident sigh, we fired him, Mike. He had bad habits. <laughs> habits which made him dishonest, Mike. Then he leaned further in, so all that he could really see now was the dent in his head and smelled his minty antiseptic breath. And he said, I trust you, Mike. You don't have any bad habits. So I'm putting my faith in you. And with that, Mr. Spaeth had, unknown to him, put a curse on me. How could he know that my life so far was a graveyard of disappointments? each tombstone carved with the faces and epitaphs of my parents, nuns, priests, football coaches, and the like. I guess I should have known. I'm not mad, Mike. I'm just, maybe this is not for you. And the great Victorian monument of diminished expectations, that's what I get for putting my faith in you. We all have these graveyards, and we know that the best thing is to put your head down, walk through them, and get out the other end. But as a teenager, I wasn't aware of that. I was wandering around in it. No, I wasn't wandering around in it. I was doing the maintenance and replenishing the flowers. So these words took a hold of my confidence and buried it with muffled screams. And then Mr. Spaeth gently took a key from his fob, and we entered the stock room. I heard it before I saw it. Clicking, a pulsing, drawing sound, a rhythmic drawing sound. And when the lights came on, in front of me, a collection of tubes and pumps along the wall, running out of a giant inverted bottles of scotch, vodka, and gin, right alongside large cylinders of soft drink syrups, each attached to a plastic collar running to a meter at the top. 
There was a ladder, and my job was to run up the ladder and read out the tiny little four-digit counters attached above the pump housing. This was an airtight feeding system of alcohol, and frankly, the antithesis of what a bar was to me. No generosity, no camaraderie or impulsive cheer. Not a milliliter of free bonhomie based drinking could escape the veins of this alcohol-dispensing abacus. <laughs> my Irish ancestry, what little of it I might have had, died then as well. But I mounted the ladder and realized as I dashed madly about on it, climbing, running down, running back up as he droned on the numbers, that Dal Mumford was a small, lithe man who was indulging his bad habits somewhere, and I was sweatily revealing my shortcomings to my superior. I got it done, but not gracefully. And I felt the disappointment from Mr. Space traveling behind him as like a wake as we climbed out of the basement and into the kitchen. I felt bad. I went over punched out, and took some consolation from extra salary. That warm feeling was short-lived, as two of the barbacks, guys a couple of years older than me, smoked and watched me coolly as I went down the loading dock stairs and started out through the alley to the bus stop. As I passed them, one of them shouted out something. It sounded like he asked me if I had pants on. I looked back and said, yes. They started laughing. I started laughing, then got on the bus, <laughs> warm in the thought that the two Latino barbacks and I had Bridge to divide with love and peace. Love, man. Years later, I got hip that they'd called me Panzon, which is lard ass. But really, I think I got off easy. My test run with the stockroom was over, though. And as the hot summer wore on, I was back behind the dishwashing machine again. And the human environment of moisture, grease, and soap for eight hours combined with no ventilation. I had not figured out yet to bring a change of clothes, and as I rode the bus back home like a wet leper, I stripped down at home in the breezeway, smelling like a swamp full of rancid beef bits. But there was hope on my horizon. And one day, Mr. Spaeth called me into his office and pointed to the file cabinet. Hanging on the top cabinet handle was a short-sleeved white shirt and a pre-tied bow tie. I looked at them and then to Mr. Spaeth, who was smiling knowingly at me. I was being made a busboy. The shirt was enough, but I had a tie, which in the restaurant business was a badge of trust and access to the front where the people were. My pleasure was apparent, and I reached over to put it on. I started to wring the tie around my neck when Mr. Spaeth held up a skinny finger, stopping me. No, this is a probation of sorts, Mike. We're going to give you a chance out front, but we're going to keep you with the dishwashers since we haven't found anyone yet. So you'll have to fill in when we're busy and get back here for the dishes, okay? Okay, I said. I didn't want to lose the opportunity, and I thought it was my chance to make good on the faith that Mr. Spaeth had invested in me. And Spaeth had faith. Believe you me. His office was covered top to bottom in Christian bromides like, God's got a promise for you, and Jesus needs your love, which I often thought was a little desperate. Occasionally, he would have prayer meetings with the barbacks and the waiters in the office, and now he proposed we do the same. <laughs> and so I knelt with this man. He put his hand out and placed it on my head. Now, I was raised a Catholic, and we don't put our hands on people. We just ask you to close your eyes, open your mouth, and trust in God. Catholics are not very touchy-feely, except in certain circumstances which, frankly, have created more problems than solutions. But I followed suit, reaching out and placing my hand right on his head. To be precise, right on the dent in his forehead. <laughs> there was a sudden flinch. He stopped praying. I looked over. He still had his eyes closed. If they'd been open, I might have ran out shrieking and never returned. But he carried on and my spiritual initiation into the Brotherhood of Busboys was complete. Next week was exciting for me. My shirt and tie hung in the workroom like a wedding dress, promising a glorious future. After a couple of days, I was asked to start splitting my time between the dishwashing and the bus station. I couldn't be more excited. As a dishwasher, I wore a t-shirt and dark pants, which in no time became a sodden mess. And the paying public was not paying to watch a sopping manatee run into their midst while trying to get down a martini in an iceberg wedge. So when I went out, I had to change into shirt and tie. That started out barely okay. But as soon as the barbacks saw this, they decided that it was their release valve. They took every opportunity to fill up a bus tub and then come and tell me to take it away. The tubs full of dishes that I received as a dishwasher before were much lighter and slightly more organized than the ones I saw when I came out for my opening night at the leather bottle. These were the stuff of silent comedy, and they'd hidden the other tubs so I couldn't offload them. The busboys had pointed me out to the waiters, 
who had assembled to become an engaged, anticipatory audience. Red hot with humiliation. Once again, I'd been put on show for someone's entertainment. But with one heaving breath, I picked the tub up briskly and walked it without making a sound into the kitchen, where I sorted it into the racks and slid it into the dishwashing machine like I was shoving it up the collective keister of mankind. This continued for about a month, but it became clear that not only was I a patsy to the barbacks, but Mr. Spaeth was getting two jobs out of one paycheck. I knew I was going to quit then. When I came in that night, Mr. Spaeth walked me over to the dishwashing machine and introduced me to a large, dull-looking teenager. His name was Gene, and he was part of a church group that Mr. Spaeth worked with, and he had been made, lo and behold, the new dishwasher. Well, now I was torn. I didn't know whether to carry on or walk out. I asked if I was going to be a full-time busboy, which was a raise, and he smiled and said, yes, but I was still on probation, so I would still only be receiving a dishwasher's salary. Well, that cinched it. But I was going to finish out this shift. Yeah, my opening night was my closing night. My final night was exquisite, in that, being my last night, I would bring the bus tubs ever so nicely stacked to Gene and line them up for him so they fed evenly into the maw of the dishwasher. I was good at the logistics of busing, and with the pressure off, could even make time to bus tables a little. Enough time to observe the restaurant around me since it would be the last time and soon just a memory. As I gazed along the regular part of the restaurant, along the bar, across the bar, was a number of quiet booths, mostly empty tonight. But unusually, the bar was as full of second-hand smoke as a Saturday night. And it was all coming from one man sitting in the booth. I could see that his ashtray was stacked, full. I went over, took the full one, and replaced it with a fresh empty. Turned and was carrying it to the bus station when the man said, Waiter, could you refill my coffee? I turned around and was going to tell him that I'm not really a waiter. And as I turned, the voice came into his familiarity, and I looked down at the great, dark, beautifully lined, twinkling eyes of Rod Serling. The overhead light making him look perfectly and eternally in the twilight zone. But also in my mind at the time, he was small, tired, sad, but extremely kind and polite. I walked the ashtray back and grabbed the coffee carafe and poured him a cup. I stood there uncomfortably for a second and asked him if he wanted cream. He looked around at the cigarettes and the coffee, looked up at me and smiled and said, I'm really not a white coffee kind of guy. Um, and left it hanging in the air for me to say, Mike. He looked at me and smiled and said, but thanks anyway, Mike. Thanks a lot. And he went back to reading his book and smoking. He was the second person from television I'd ever seen. The first was a local lovable clown host named Wizzo, who, though lots of fun when I was young, rapidly got kicked down the stairs in my estimation to make room for the meeting of a god. I couldn't help but every once in a while peek out and just look at him. I didn't dare walk over to talk to him. But the haze of smoke above him and the light below him was as if he knew where his lighting was and where the effect was. And for a man who was so eminently non-theatrical, he knew how to make himself look present in the moment. Later, I submitted for the leather bottle's approval, my two weeks notice, and finally took away some appreciation of the food industry, which would stand me later in good stead as an actor, a chronic fungal infection, and an eternal, simple moment from the master of early television. All in all, a trifecta in my mind. Wow, that is an amazing story. Thank Honestly, you. Mike, I was with you the entire time. I could picture everything. I like to paint with words. I sometimes paint a bit too much, but I do enjoy it. And I think uh, since I started as an actor, really, I, uh, I write to speak. And so, you know. So how old were you? I think it was 14. So 69, 55. Yes, yeah, 14. So you didn't have to be 16 to work? No, um, I didn't. No, I didn't. There was something I can't. I have to look back. I'm, I was able to do it. And I had to, my parents had to sign off. Yeah. I had to sign off. My first job, I was 15, but yeah. and it was in a restaurant, but I lied and said I was 16. But they were uh, like paying me under the table, so it was never, right. you know, there was no paperwork anyway. 
So what was Rod Serling doing in Kansas City? I found out later he was there to talk on a late night talk show about his brother Robert J. Serling's book, The President's Plane is Missing, which was made into a film. Oh. So both of them were uh, writers. Uh, his, obviously, Rod was uh, on the top more successful, but he was just helping his brother out. And when he was there, you said he looked sad. Was he lonely? Do you think he was? He just was. T- he was tired and a haggard man who was probably doing a lot of New York, L.A., New York, L.A. And you know, um, he was a chain smoker too. Yeah, and of course, my mom was a chain smoker. It makes you look tired. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. But people, isn't it funny now? You know, I watch Mad Men or whatever, and you just see mm-hmm. the way it was, and it's like, mm-hmm. didn't. Anybody didn't smoking ever occur to anybody that <laughs> this is what's bringing me down or this is what's making right. me look like shit. And like nobody knew it. what was going on. <laughs> I'm always amazed by so that. I mean, it, 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 there was nobody telling you there was something wrong with it, and it was a, it's a highly, if not one of the most highly addictive drugs in the world. And so if there's no, you know, social uh, intercession going, we really shouldn't be doing this, you know. And he had advertisers sure. dressing people up as doctors going, it satisfies the T-zone. Right. And I remember my dad telling me about his first open heart surgery. His doctor would leave the room to have a smoke and come back in. and That's hilarious. You know what I mean? Like it was, yeah. it was nothing. Okay, let's go down the list of when you start <laughs> in a restaurant. I forgot the dishwasher is lower yeah, than busboy. Yeah. I'm going to go dishwasher, busboy, bus boy. then... Maybe bar back. Bar back, for sure. Yeah, bar back. Yeah, they're, they're busting their Even it sounds like a physical condition. Yeah. yeah. Well, bar back, I mean, you're bringing up the, the, the beverages and the kegs, and you know, you're just moving things constantly. In this case, things. that was taken away from them because there was this automated system. Yeah. Which really was for its time, 1969, 70, around that era. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Yeah, you, you described that. So what did it It was do? on a wall. It was along the wall. And so you had <laughs> in these, they had these sort of like metal... Uh, metal belts that you stuck the bottles in and then you you ran and they were face down and then they plugged this plastic sleeve over them like a hydraulic or uh, air jack <laughs> connector and then that ran with a pump up through a meter that metered it out in its portions one ounce of yeah, a, a exactly. shot or whatever yeah, that's pretty yeah. that's pretty amazing for 1969 it was this was these these guys that ran the restaurant were big restaurateurs in Kansas City still <clears throat> Some restaurants, the Plaza Three, uh, Hulahans. They, you know, they were, they were <laughs> Hulahans. We had that in yeah, Pittsburgh. On, Wait, Mr. Spaeth, did he move on? Do you think he went on to bigger and better things? Because he sounds I, like a I jerk. Heard, I heard he embezzled from the restaurant. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> if I didn't you get have, that story, but I have wanted posters to. in your office that says "Jesus needs your love." You're, something's wrong with you, man. He that was, is so crazy. He wasn't pervy, but he was that pre-Jesus freak evangelical American that that as I'm an American Catholic we're you know we're always like one Catholics they don't read the Bible we're fine to let somebody else tell us what oh, it's yeah. about well, right? you weren't you know? allowed to read the Bible yeah, there, you know. there were no because I was brought up Catholic and yeah. there were no Bibles in the church you know why because who are you to think you're going to talk directly to God we're going to put somebody in between and yeah. they'll tell you yeah, what you should be reading exactly. If you think that's a good idea, remember what happened to Joan of Arc, you know? No, what? Well, well she got burned at the stake. Oh, the basic, see, the basic, <laughs> as a heretic, as a heretic, her basic premise was, um, if you read the play by uh, George Bernard Shaw St. Joan, the big theme in it is like, I'm telling them that the church is great, but they don't need you, the priests. Right. The church is magnificent. And she sees the church as an org- not as an organization, as a extrapolation of God's love. Mm-hmm. Not an organization to stand between God and man and interpret. Which is what it became. It did become. I mean, it went from, if you look at the history of the, of, of the church from the Middle East when it moves to Europe, it occupied uh, the position of ascetics, of, of self-mortifying priests who lived on tiny islands. Skellig St. Michael, where the new Star Wars, where Luke Skywalker is, that's where the first priests came from the East to live in Europe and moved from there. They lived on those big craggy rocks and there were no porgs then. What's a porg? <laughs> porg is a creature from the movie of Star Wars. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, they, what they did is they got all these puffins on this, full of puffins. I love puffins. You know? And so I think the effects guys went, man, our, our wide shots have got puffins all over the place. Let's create something called the porg and we'll just color all these things brown. So we do tight shots, we'll just insert a digital creature that is like them. Wait, are there really puffins in the movie? There's no puffins, but the, the porgs are the exact size of a, of puffin. a puffin. Interesting. <laughs> this is getting crazy, man. I don't know where uh, you're for at. Me, well, for me, I just, I, 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 the magic of film, having been in the business now, it is. It's a wonderful, it's an amazing thing. But it's always based on practicality. 
always practicality. They don't give you a limo because they think you're important. They give you a limo because they want you on the set on time. They don't, they don't bow to all your negotiations because they really think you're a special person. It's your manager is like beat them into the ground and they're, the, they're the, the jerk so you can say, I don't know what's going on. They just want to keep negotiating, keeping you happy. It's a practicum. And so I think if they saw an island covered with puffins on their, mate, on their, op, on their shots, they went, what are we do with these things? Let's make porks. That's, it's a cute character. We could turn it into a plush toy. You know who you remind me of so much? Who? Is Rick Overton. Well, Rick's my, one of my best friends. You remind me so much of him. You too. I want to get stoned with both of you <laughs> and just sit in the middle. And I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to listen and learn. You seem to have... Were you a history major? Uh, no, I was I was just a theater major, but uh, I like to read and I like history. And, I've been, and I, I have to play up to my friends in the game of life. And my friends are people like Rick and Greg Proops. Smart people, man. Very intelligent. I know, and I know. <clears throat> erudite, but not intellectual bullies they're bright people but they don't wield for the most part don't wield their intelligence meaning that they want to they won't put you down they right because they want the best of you too yeah they're they trying to rise all ships and it's not a com- competition right. i love that with people i want to talk a little bit i want to talk a lot about your improv career but yeah. real quick back to the restaurant real quick yeah. um worst job i always had in the restaurant was marrying the ketchups <laughs> what was your worst side work my worst job was I worked at a restaurant in Stockton, California when I was in junior college called the Big Yellow House. And you pay what you weigh. They had a scale. <laughs> we had that. Had the ground scale. round. The yeah. ground round was the same. Pay, yeah. pay what you weigh. It might have been the same chain. Peanuts all over the floor. Yeah. Again, and, and you'd have to come up with this big, this yellow shirt and a tie, and like really, like like uh, I don't know, really like hee haw ish and sort of. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'll be, welcome to the Big Yellow House. I'll be your waiter today. And now, as you know, we got our cornbread and honey butter as much as you can eat. And here at the Big Yellow House, <laughs> you pay what you weigh. And you're like, oh my lord, you know. And, and we'd go back, and we had um, the people that ran the restaurant were this couple again a super evangelical Christian couple ah. and the the husband looked like Dean Jones and who's Dean Jones Dean Jones was a Disney character actor sort of a Darren Stevensy looking oh I see guy and his wife was this totally booming oh wow totally booming uh bright you know oh um WKRP in Cincinnati. Yeah, uh, Lori, Lonnie Anderson. Lonnie Anderson type. Yeah, 20 years same, younger than him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, about the same age, but dressed like her. Yeah. And, you know, we were just like, and they would have prayer meetings, and they would, you know. Or you like know, Tammy Faye Baker. Yeah, and she, very, you know, you go, yeah. everybody kneel, and we kind of like, and she'd go, come on, kneel with me. We'd go, oh, yeah, we're all like 20. <laughs> going, kneel down, kneel down. Her, 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 her. <laughs> um, idiots, we're immature idiots. Hey, I can picture, I can picture changing an ashtray like I put my socks on in a restaurant. True. Yep, you would take one ashtray, yeah. cover it, and bring it toward you so that right. the, no ashes flew out, right. and then take that dirty one away with your left right. hand while you're replacing the other one with your right hand. I can picture it. And even though they don't smoke in restaurants, there was some place where they did a chain. They did something. I can't remember. I was, a couple, I was somewhere where they did it really badly. And I was like, <laughs> and also, oh, they cleaned the table by instead of spraying the the spray on the on cloth, the cloth right. they sprayed the table. And now there's spray and there's, everywhere. You're selling, it's and I it was in Kansas City at a oh. restaurant, and I freaked out on the guy. And the guy, of course, he looked at me like, "You old man." I'm like, "God, really? Yeah. yeah." Would you like me to come and spray stuff on your food? Kids today. Kids. Do you go back to Kansas City often? Uh, I haven't been back for about two years. I go back. Who's there? Um, Tommy, my best friend. Um, um, I go back, Tommy, some of my mom's families up in northern Kansas. Yeah. Belleville and Scandia. Uh, they're in their 90s. And that sounds quite like, old. it doesn't even sound like real places. Scandia and Belleville. <laughs> Concordia. It's Concordia, and it's my favorite. Concordia, the city of Concordia in Cloud County, Kansas. Wow. It's as beautiful as a Thomas Hart Benton painting. It and really C is. words are always funniest, of yeah. course. So that would be perfect. Cloud City, Kansas. Cloud County. Yeah, yeah Cloud, Cloud County. County. So, okay, and we don't have a lot of time. But oh, I could sorry, talk yeah. to you all day. No, it's it's unfortunate. That's where my dad you... met my mom. He was from Minnesota, and he was in he ran a prisoner of war camp in Kansas. Truly. For Rommel's Africa Corps. Unbelievable. Yeah. Truly. Yeah. And this was for 
for, 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 P- for POWs. POWs, for, yes. For Japanese internees. Originally, they were going to have Italians come uh, there as somebody from Anzio the, uh, after the battle. But we got, uh, my dad was announced that they got Rommel's troops. And so they had to change everything up. So I'll tell you about it someday. I, I'm writing that sounds a, like a stunning story. Well, I'm writing a film script about my mom and oh, dad. Oh, I'm so glad. Do you write a lot? I'm writing more now because as an older actor, I'm not working as much. Yeah. Well, you still get called in. I when get you, called in for things. When you get called in, do you feel like you're right for every part? But then you walk in the audition room and then everybody else is right. I belong to a theater company called Antius. Antius. It's a big theater company here with a, a stable of... Uh, Academy Award and Tony nominated actors. Some I think may have won. Uh, ones you have seen on TV. I went in for this audition for Young Sheldon. Four lines. Basically, it was Rashomon. It was two lines and then set again in a different way for a different point of view. And I got out of the elevator and there's Harry Groner. Harry Groner is Tony nominated actor for uh, for a oh. I can't remember for the something film. big. Yeah, he's Tony nominated. He created one of the original roles in Cats. Wow. Armin Shimmerman's there, who was Quark in Deep Space Nine, I think. You know, uh, so what's that character. like? You so know these guys. I know they these guys. know you. It's all lighthearted because we all realize this is like we're the group of the most overqualified actors in the world. And then a guy named Richard Fancy, who's a fine character actor, you know, theater actor, really great actor. And we're all laughing about it. And I said, you know, the only way I'm going to get this job, I need... You know, I'm going to imitate my buddy Rick Overton. I'm going to do it like Rick. And the minute I said it, the door opens up and Rick walks in. And so now there's these 50, 60, 70-year-old men. We're all laughing our asses off. And the casting assistant comes in to shush us like we're kids. And she's like, what's going on? I go, we just realized that between us, we have enough hair for one person. And that we're extremely overqualified. And she looked at us and kind of like, eh. It went so, back in. Okay, so here's my question, and I think a lot of people out there listening mm-hmm. don't understand this either. Why do they even go through a casting call for four lines when they know Mike McShane could do it or Rick Overton could do it? Why don't they just call him up and say, hey, bring Rick Overton in to do these four lines, please? And Rick, of course, would say, sure, I'll be there. Like, what is this auditioning for a baby line anyway? Um, I believe it's a, it's a continuation of uh, the studios having been bought by corporate uh, entities and the corporate philosophy, uh, depending on our economy at any given time, if it's uh, it's more liberal when the money's flowing and when the money's tight, and in a sense when new platforms have opened up that they're trying to merchandise, that they're trying to spend less money on the thing that will make them money and and give and parcel out to many different places. So the rules become tighter, and the guessing game goes the the world of relationships that show business is made out of lessens to a larger degree. So the old days of the studio system, as much as the horrors, especially for women in it, it was get Bobby, you know, get Tony. I just watched Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, oh, yeah. which was that produced was by Cubby Broccoli, wow. which was written by Ian Fleming. Cubby Broccoli. Desmond Llewellyn. That's a terrific name. <laughs> Desmond Llewellyn's in the beginning is a sort of northern, oh, you're going to have to sell that car, you know, with the big leather breeches. And he's the guy who sells them the invented the car, which will become Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. The, the car that's this wild invention. Desmond Llewellyn played Q, Q in all the Bond series. Mm-hmm. The guy, oh, 007, put that, that's not a lighter, that's a gun. Right. And so Cubby went, you know what? Hey, this guy's like going to be, hey, get Desmond to do it. Des will do it for a good price. And Des, who's a working actor, went, oh, how much? Fair play then. Takes a car off to Shepperton, has a couple of days of work, nips off, makes, you know. Okay, so? So Cubby had a relationship with the man. He's the producer. He said, just go ahead. It's easy. There's no thinking about it. Right. Call the cast and, yeah, have them hire. They still, they're still like that in England. England is less fussy and weird about show business generally because they've been doing it since some guy named Orful picked up a liar and went, here's a little song called Beowulf. You know, they've been doing it for a long time. They've been transposing information for their culture a long time. Show business is, filming it is just another version of it. Yeah, but, okay, I, and, and we uh, got to wrap this up. But I'm listen, sorry, yeah. no, it's okay, but I'm, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is, like, are you saying that they want to keep these people employed? Like, we need the casting people, we need the casting assistants, and so we may as well run through the because be, the, the producers become... want to choose. So why can't we, why not bring in 25 guys for these four lines? Because we want to choose anyway. It shows you've done some due diligence in the corporate world. I see. 
you've done some weeding out. You've taken some time to do that. And so uh, when you go on these auditions, I mean, and I go on a lot of commercial auditions, but when you go on these acting auditions, you know, there's a lot of money or there's a bit of money at stake because yeah. somebody, one of these, you know, 20 people in the room are going to make, you know, a couple of grand anyway and right. they're going to have a good day. Right. So we all want this job. But of course, you have no, con- all you can huh, do is do your best. Unless you're a woman. All you do is do your best and then you just got to walk out. So do yeah. you see the, like I do this, like, I, I tell myself, this is just an errand. Just run in, say the line, get the fuck back out, you know, get back out to your car. But I am bummed out when I don't get things, and I do get disappointed. I pick it up, I enjoy it, and I put it down. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have had a continual career as a stage actor and as an improviser. So, there's you know, I've had forums in which to act and perform, so I don't have years where I'm not performing where they can work against you, um, your confidence. So... You know, I I can go and do that because I know that like four months ago, uh, I was in 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 the United Kingdom playing to three thousand people improvising Shakespeare in the courtyard of of a palace. And, that must have you know, been stunning. Or I've been on the West End and I've done that. Or was that amazing? That real quick, always. that English experience improvising it always is, it always is. improvising Shakespeare for three thousand people. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. At Windsor Castle. Wow. Yeah. Just tell me. I mean, you love it. You hate it. The, the actors are better. Are the improv people better? I love it. I love it. But we don't need to hire a British actors to be Star Star Wars people because they're black. We can hire black American actors to do it. I see. Uh, um, I'm of that. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, in that way, I'm like, uh, John Boyega is fantastic. And he's a fine actor. He's great. He really is. Uh, uh, but there's a point which, there, you know, there's some well-trained African American or if you want to be a black actress in this country, young black men and women who are fantastic. And they're getting in, but I don't know what it is. It's a corporate thing. Maybe they pay them an overall fee with less um, residuals in the end because in the end, residuals is what makes you... But these English actors are SAG also. I guess they are. Do you think that England has better improvisers than America in general or just because of their history and all the people and... How about for women? Because they're, in my opinion, I don't know that many famous female, you know, British uh, improvisers and actresses. It just doesn't don't come to mind. Uh, but but here in the states, they all come to mind. Your absolute perception is absolutely right. But it's changing. There's female improvisers like Ruth Bratt, Pippa Evans, Carrie Ed Lloyd. I'm sorry, I can't. There's a bunch. Well, that's of already. I didn't know there those are people. amazing young improvisers, and we did a. A live version of Whose Lines It Anyway in Edinburgh this year at the festival. Yeah. And uh, Greg, you know, hadn't met Carrie Ad Lloyd, and she's this petite, sparkly, Welsh, English, little brown, black, you know, black hair, bright eyes. And she's tiny. And uh, she gets on stage, and they give him like an improvised, a Swedish drama, <laughs> detective drama, and, you know, fake Swedish. And he, you know, he kind of looks at me like, well, we'll see what happens with her, kind of, because Greg's great, but he's still a little like, Ew. And she wiped up the floor with him. Aww. And you're like, and I, he looked at me, I'm like, oh, yeah, get used to it. Talent, The man. women here are here, and they're amazing. So there's always Josie, which is sort of their, their idol, and rightfully so, Josie Lawrence. Sandy Toxfig was on the show, and Sandy has moved away from improvising, has become sort of a cultural fixture on QI, a game show, and a host on the, the Great British Baking Challenge. So, I dated a guy in England <laughs> for a couple of years. Yeah. He was a soccer player. Yeah. And we'd go over to, he, he lived in Southampton. Ooh. And uh, I, I have never been so bored in my life as I was in England. I'm sorry. The television was horrible. The food was horrible. The weather was horrible. <laughs> and then the bar closed. The pub is closed at 10 o'clock. Like, yeah. And then we're done. And then you wake up and do it again. And I had very little energy energy to do anything because the weather's not It's just... A weird place. Oh, you sounds like you're a California person. I guess. Yeah, that's cool. No, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And it's changed quite a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. in London, too. And so uh, where I work a lot is a place called the Many A Chocolate Factory, which is in Suffolk, across from London Bridge, which is where Borough Market is. And Borough Market's an ancient, venerable ancient market with some of the best food and cheese, breads, meats in the world. It's also where, tragically, that uh, attack was uh, 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 last year. But... The food now is amazing. You yeah, can, I, I very, think that I haven't very, been to England in 20 no, years. I don't well, know what you're, you're absolutely. And in London, definitely the bars have changed. They got all yeah. night. You drink. You can drink all night, <laughs> which, of course, the British are raw right, off that. I am. Oh, know? really? They don't close at 10 anymore. Not anymore. Some of the pubs do in the outlying, con- outlying areas. But I remember London. traveling to you know London many times. And you know you would obviously have your pounds, right? And, yeah. and, and so then 
you would have to change that money back in because you're not going to get the, yeah. you know you're not going to get the yeah. money exchange. So I would just put I would just push a bunch of pence on the bar and say I need as much beer as that that pence. <laughs> Give me the uh, the amount of beer that will pay for that those pencers. Did they go for it? Yeah, remember they would have a little. I remember in many places in England yeah. at the counter, like at, yeah. not Seven yeah. Eleven, but another convenience store, would be like have a pencer, leave a pencer, need a pencer, take a pencer, <laughs> spend a penny. <laughs> Which is great. It's also, that's a phrase for using the bathroom. He's like, oh, I've had too much beer. I'll go, go spend a penny. I've never heard that. You just have to drop a penny in the thing to open the bathroom up to get into it. Oh, my God. You crack me up. you for everything. Thank you so much for Christine coming on the Blessing. show, this Mike. You're such an interesting person. You're a great host. And again, thank you for um, participating in Story Smash a couple of weeks back. That was a lot of fun yeah. down at the Improv. So thank you for that. All right, you guys, I got to wrap it up right about now. I want to thank you so much again for tuning in today. Let Mike know that you liked his story and tweet him over at this Mike McShane. And then, of course, follow me over there as well at StoryWorthy. And join us next week on StoryWorthy for the very funny Bob Wilt Fung talking about being a news reporter right out of college. So one day I remember this was a, an example of how much you had to improvise kind of news. I covered a, a fifth grade field trip that was going through a historic housing district of Lake Charles. They were looking at houses and talking about the architecture of these houses. I was just like, oh, my God. Don't miss actor Bob Wiltfong next week on Story for Thee. All right, you guys, I want to thank everybody over at Wondery Media, including Hernan Lopez and everybody on the Wondery team. There's a team. I bet there is. And I want to give a huge thank you to all the sponsors on the show today. You guys, I appreciate it so much when you support my sponsors because in turn you are in fact supporting me. So thank you. And one more time on behalf of the very talented Mike McShane, thank you so much. My pleasure, Christine. My name is Christine Blackburn saying make it the story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Your favorite band's about to play a sold-out show. You got in. Over here. With a friend. And found a spot close enough to see the set list. They're definitely playing your song. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise and eat better? You really can do it. But nobody is going to do it for you. And nobody has to, because you can do it if you have the right tools and a community that cares about helping you get results. And that's us, Beachbody. It's as convenient as your TV or laptop, but you need to decide that you're worth it. Let us help you succeed. Here's how. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great.